Good morning. Good morning. Open up in your Bibles with me to the book of Jude. The book of Jude. I had a weird dream last night that I was teaching and I couldn't find the book of Jude. I was looking all over the Bible. In this dream, I had like three Bibles on the podium for some reason. Couldn't find it in any of them. Finally found it and it was in Spanish. I couldn't read it. It's really weird. It's right here. It's in English. Thank God. Um, also, it's only just one page, probably, maybe two at the most. It's a really small book. It's right before Revelation. So if you don't know where it's at, open to Revelation and then make a left. I stole that joke from another pastor. I'm sorry. All right, let's pray and we'll begin our study this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that in it there's so much hope and truth. So we just want to ready our hearts, our minds, Lord, and surrender to you this morning. As we sang earlier, you are worthy. You're worthy of all of it, all that we are. Much less, I mean, just an hour of our time on a Sunday morning, Lord, but we want to surrender everything to you. Our will, our hearts, our minds, our Bible study time. So we thank you for this moment, uh, this, this, this time we dedicate it to you and ask that your spirit would speak clearly to us, edify our hearts this morning. Build us up in your truth and in your love. You are the foundation. We rest on you, Lord God. Speak now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, the title of our message is Keep Yourselves in the Love of God. We're going to continue with this theme of the last days. If you weren't here last week, the uh, recording is available through audio and video on YouTube. Uh, we've been discussing the last days. Last week was a timeline, but this morning, we're kind of sh going to shift gears into some more practical application. Noticing the days that we live in is one thing, but how do we respond to uh, the, the, the times, the signs of the times and whatnot? So living in the last days is something spoken of very abundantly in the New Testament, despite how old it is, uh, because it's just characteristic of our faith. It's always been this way, even in the time of the apostles, because there's always been this mindset that Jesus can return at any moment. And we are to be always ready. The encouragement is to always be ready. And, and, and along with that characteristic of the faith, characteristic of the last days is the reality of, of false teachers, the presence of false teachers, apostasy, people falling away and deceiving others. And so the epistle of Jude, if you haven't already read it, it's a short read, I encourage you to do so, but the emphasis there is false teachers, certain men, as Jude refers to them as, the idea that there will be people who fall away, not just outside of the church, but even within the church, the danger of false teachings, uh, wicked doctrines, and, 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 and all the rest. And this is something characteristic uh, you know, throughout the, the epistles. You see it in 1 Timothy, you see it in, in, in 2 Timothy, you see it in the writings of Peter. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, this is the New Living Translation, he writes, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. So the epistle of Jude is written to encourage believers, but also warn them against false teachers and doctrines. So for those of you that don't know, the epistle of Jude was written by Jude. Jude is actually one of the most common names in the New Testament, but it's usually in a variant form, such as Judas. Uh, the Hebrew form would be Judah. 
Jude is one of the last letters written as part of the New Testament. By the time Jude was written, epistles like Galatians and, and, and James had been in circulation for a few decades. Along with James, he's the author of the New Testament epistle, James, Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. But the way that he opens up the letter, he chooses to identify himself as Jude, brother of James, and a servant of Christ. That word servant in the Greek, I think is better translated. In the ESV, it says servant, but I think maybe a little bit more accurately and a little bit more, I don't know, direct would be the translation of slave. You know, Jude, a slave of Christ. Someone who is owned completely by another. And, and, and in the context of our relationship to Jesus, this is in reference to our self-serving will being set aside as we seek the will of God first and foremost. The fact that we have been bought and bought with a price, that we are no longer our own. And I think that's a little bit more accurate because servant might give you the idea of someone who's hired to do a job, but that's not how Jude refers to himself as. He refers to himself as being owned by Jesus and belonging to the household of God. Now, again, this is kind of an interesting dynamic because Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. That is to say, biologically, he is descended from, from Mary. We know with the Immaculate Conception that there's an interesting dynamic there. So I don't know how much of us really want to consider ourselves slaves to our brother. So something interesting happened in, Jude life, in Jude's life that brought him to this point because we know along with his other brothers, I believe there's four named in the New Testament. So it's Simon, James, um, who's the other guy? Joseph, and Joseph's the dad as well as his brother, and then Jude. Or, Ju or Judas uh, uh, is how he's referred to in the uh, Gospels. We know that his brothers did not believe in him during his earthly ministry. It says in John uh, 7, verse 5, I believe it is, uh, his brothers didn't believe in him elsewhere. We know that they, we kind of uh, see uh, uh, some skepticism and some doubt amongst his family unit as a whole. Now, we do know that that changed after the resurrection. James specifically saw the, res the risen, resurrected Christ, and it impacted him so much that he became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And so sure of the resurrection of who, to him, was his half-brother, but more importantly, was the Messiah, that James was martyred along with the others. James specifically, he was stoned to death for his faith in Christ. So, so impactful on James and Jude and among others that they gave up skepticism and were firm believers in this absolute truth in who Jesus was, not just as this guy from Galilee born in Bethlehem, but the Son of God, the risen Son of God. And this understanding of the truth of God's Word led to the writing of this epistle that would denounce anything that is contrary to these truths. This understanding of absolute truth is important to Jude, to James, to Peter and Paul, and, and, and should be to us, especially living in a post-modern type of age where, where the culture has been influenced by post-modern philosophies. We have so emphasized individualism that many believe that truth is whatever it is that you believe in, and that each truth is subject to whoever it is that possesses that truth. That is to say that truth is subjective and not absolute. That's the understanding that our culture operates on. You can believe whatever it is that you want, and as long as you keep it to yourself and go in line with the status quo, you're, you're good to go, culturally speaking. 
And there's a danger in that. It's existed throughout the church age. And so we're going to read verse 17 through the end of the book that ends with verse 25. Uh, we're going to start with verse 17. I take it back. Let's start with 16. Give ourselves a little bit of context. It says in verse 16, Jude spends much of his epistle focusing on false teachers, apostates, people whom he refers to as certain men who have gone astray. He says, these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Verse 17, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of, of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. So as Jude devotes most of this book describing false teachers and the judgment that they will receive, he refers to the teachings of the apostles. In 2 Timothy verse 3, we're going to read 1 through 5. This is what Paul is writing to Timothy, giving the same kind of warning. He says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. So these false teachers, they are all over the place, especially in these last days, and they're fighting a war against truth. And these false teachers, they exist within the church and outside of the church, and we need to be aware of that, churches everywhere are compromising on the truth of God's word, shaping their doctrine to fit, for example, cultural norms regarding ethics, uh, sexuality, marriage, life, and everything else, trying to shape these things to fit the cultural norms rather than God's word. And there's a danger in that you cannot base your doctrine, your understanding of God, your understanding of morality. You can't base these things on the culture because the culture is always changing. I mean, it, was just, it wasn't that long ago that this, the slave trade was culturally acceptable. And so if we're basing our morality on culture, we're in some deep deep trouble because whatever the culture says and that's what we kind of go along with and in regards to the fact that these are false teachers this isn't just referring to pastors and spiritual teachers gurus or whatever it is you want to call them or whoever it is that that, that they that whatever title they've taken upon themselves reverends and all the rest there are more false teachers, I think, than we realize. Specifically because of we're living in the information age, and information is disseminated and, and distributed so easily that you can make a post and it reaches the eyes of hundreds, sometimes thousands, sometimes millions. There are many people today who want to be social media influencers, and they use these platforms to express their views and develop a following. And a lot of times these influencers, they're not necessarily saying anything new, but they parrot what they've been taught. And so they post about that, they share it. With minimal research involved, those who are influenced by them soak it up, 
The thought bubbles that exist these days are huge. They involve thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. They click share, and so this sort of corrupted disciple-making process is perpetuated through social media, through text. Because information and ideas are so easily shared, both good and bad, we need to be aware of the dangers that are out there. We need to watch what we say as well. It's like, I mean, we just post stuff, we complain about people, we, we complain about whatever, post it, look for validation through likes and shares, and, and, and not being mindful of the fact that, that we ourselves are, are distributing information and making an impact on people. And so there's a need for us as well within the church to self-examine to be growing in grace, to be growing in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as Jude goes from talking about the false teachers, he shifts gears to talk about us. And he says in verse 17, but you, you must remember beloved. And beloved is, is actually how he opens up the book. He says it in verse 3, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, for certain people who have crept in unnoticed. I'll just stop right there. The point being is that Jude was excited to write about salvation. He wanted to talk about the gospel. He wanted to talk about, you know, Christ and him crucified, but he found it necessary to write about this, the need for us to contend for the faith. That word contend, it's a word that uh, involves, I don't know, it's, it's like a struggle. It's a, it's a term used in reference to wrestling, for example. He says to contend earnestly for the faith. He wanted to write about our salvation, talk about the gospel, but he saw the dangers of this world, the dangerous state in which we live in. As was prophesied by the apostles, these are what the last days are going to be like. So he says, remember, remember the words of the apostles, the prophecies and the predictions that they have given. And so that brings us to our first point. Remember God's word. Remember God's word. Jude might be quoting Peter in this instance. Peter says, above, and this is 2 Peter verse, chapter 3, verse 3, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. So in all these warnings against false teachers, there's an encouragement here that we need to go to the source of what we know to be true. In the midst of all these lies, the best way to combat them is not necessarily through arguments or comments. I don't even comment when I read stuff. I'm just like, this, there's no point in getting on online debates. The best way to spot a counterfeit, for example, is to study the real thing. If you're a cashier, you're handling money, the best way to spot a counterfeit is to know what a real thing, what a real bill looks like. And so study the word and show yourself approved. Know what you believe and know it well. Biblical illiteracy is a huge danger in the church because you're all the more susceptible to the, 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 the doctrines of demons and the falsehoods that are being taught. I some, you know, for example, sometimes I see Christians getting trapped in legalism. And rather than being set free by the gospel, because the Bible is not legalistic. In fact, there's a lot in here against legalism. But rather than being set free by the truth of the gospel, I've seen people who struggle with legalism, they just re retreat to false doctrines and philosophies and just end up deconstructing or giving up on their faith. And it's sad. 
So in verse 20, or rather, verse 19. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Jude, when he's talking about these dangerous teachers, certain men, he talks about the judgment that they will receive from God. And you can read about that in the, in the previous verses. I encourage you, kind of just read this whole letter in, in one sitting, and, and, and then maybe you can even study it if it, if it so speaks to you. Uh, but throughout this letter, he talks about the judgment on these false teachers. And now Jude wants to talk about how we respond to these certain individuals. And he doesn't talk about us waging war or retaliating through slander or, or whatever else. He talks about the judgment that they will receive from God. The encouragement here, at least for me, is that God will deal with them. The Lord will handle it. Jesus says it's better for a millstone to be tied around their neck and cast them into the sea. He's going to deal with it at, in his way. I don't need to go tying around millstones on people's necks and throwing them in the ocean. That's not my job, thank God. God will deal with the false teachers. There's a time to respond, I believe, to rebuke, a time to be silent, a time to, be rebuke, to rebuke, a, a time to contend. But everything that we do needs to honor Christ as Lord. This war, this war against truth, ultimately it's spiritual. So firstly, we must be equipped and built up in the faith. And so Jude has a few encouragements here, and, and, and that brings us to our second point, is to remain in God's love. To remain in God's love. These people who are devoid of the Spirit, they're not familiar with God's love. And so they say things contrary to God's love. We ought to keep ourselves in God's love. It says in John 15, verse 9, this is the words of Jesus. He says, as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. Now, when, when, when Jude says, keep yourselves in the love of God, we understand that God loves us regardless of what we have done or what we do. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we have a relationship with God, not based on what we have done, but what Christ has done for us on the cross. But the fruit of fellowship with God requires that we abide in Christ. We have a part to play in this. I mean, give me an example. Like marriage is established as a covenant between two people. But the flourishing of marriage is found in mutual love. It's not just in a marriage certificate or on a wedding day or wedding photos that are 10, 20, 30 years old but on the continuous commitment to one another, pouring into one another mutually. That's why in, in John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So as far as practical things that we can do to keep ourselves in that love, growing, being edified, we see a few things, and it's not on the screen, but I mean, if you're taking notes, you can write them down or make a mental note uh, if you'd like. Uh, firstly, to build yourself up. He says in verse 20, build yourselves up, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. One Bible commentator describes it as this, and, and, and I really appreciated it. He says, 
That is to say, the life of the Christian is founded not on something which he manufactured himself, but on something which he received. There is a chain in the transmission of the faith. The faith came from Jesus to the apostles, it came from the apostles to the church, and it comes from the church to us. There is something tremendous here. It means that the faith which we hold is not merely someone's personal opinion. It is a revelation which came from Jesus Christ and was preserved and transmitted within his church, always under the care and the guidance of the Holy Spirit from generation to generation. So there is a responsibility with every Christian, a responsibility to mature in his or her faith, your own faith. But it's not based on your opinion. It's not based on changing philosophies. The Word of God is the foundation for our faith. It tells us about who God is and what He has done. There is an event in history that we can point to the death and the resurrection of Christ by which we can say that death is defeated, Christ has won the victory, we have been bought by God's grace, that our faith isn't based on the culture which is constantly in flux, and it's not based on feelings, it's not based on changing philosophies, it's not based on emotions, it's not based on anyone else's faith, because there's a danger in that too, to rely so much on a spiritual leader, pastor, reverend, whatever, who will inevitably disappoint you. And then people fall away when, 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 when someone that they relied on falls away. Rather than basing their faith and being built up on the firm foundation that is Christ. The second encouragement that he gives in this verse is to pray in the Spirit. Building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. It says the scoffers, the scoffers, they're devoid of the Spirit. They don't know. They don't know Him. But we have a resource, a comforter, and a friend in the Holy Spirit. So the word serving as a foundation and praying in the Spirit, it gives us the power that we need to walk with Him to abide in Him, to bear fruit in Him. Just keep yourselves in the love of God, abiding in Christ. And then lastly, in verse 21, he says, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Hope is integral to our maturity in Christ. And I think we've discussed it a couple weeks ago. When we're studying end times in the last days, it always needs to be in the context of the hope that we have in Christ. It's not about freaking out over doomsday prophecies. I mean, don't get me wrong, when you read about the tribulation, it's a harrowing reality. But there's hope in Christ. There's hope in knowing that he has already won the victory and that he's returning to confirm that in all of creation. And so this word translated as waiting, in verse 21, some of your Bibles might say looking. It means to earnestly expect something. To have an earnest expectation. So waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So Christ's salvation, we know, is salvation ultimately from being saved from our sin, being saved from the wrath of God, but also it means salvation, deliverance from the evils of this world. When Jesus talks about the last days, he likens it unto two 
narratives in the book of Genesis, the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Both scenarios feature the wrath of God and the deliverance of God's people. The wrath of God on, on the whole world through the flood and the deliverance of Noah and his family. The wrath of God on Sodom and Gomorrah, but the, the, the deliverance of Lot and his family. And so it's easy to get discouraged when we look at the state of our world to feel perhaps a sense of defeat. But we know that Christ has the victory, that there is hope to be had in Jesus, that there's deliverance that we are waiting for, not in in in. in in the sense that you wait for a FedEx package and then it gets delivered to a different address and you know you kind of make some phone calls waiting for with an eager expectation knowing that it is coming and bear in mind as we look at these two verses verses 20 and 21 the encouragement here so far has been inward reflection an examining of the heart. It's an ex- it's when, especially in the context of false teachers, there's an external threat, but as a response, we look internally at our hearts and where we are with Christ. Especially as I consider verse six, 16, As Jude refers to them as grumblers, malcontents, following sinful desires, loud mouth, yikes, showing favoritism to gain advantage, using people. And, and, and there, there seems to be an emphasis on the way that they use their words to get what they want. The grumblers and grumblers are constantly looking at problems and offering no solution. When I look at the sort of cultural climate that we live in. It's constant complaining and vilifying and anger. And yeah, I can't say that we, we are always doing all that much better, if at all. But you, beloved, don't grumble. Constantly complaining about the loss, complaining about the culture, complaining about people. But ground yourselves in God's love. Be who God made you to be. We can con- There's a danger in grumbling and complaining because it, it, it necessitates that you see yourselves as better than others and higher than whatever it is that you're complaining about. But it's only by God's grace and by his mercy that we stand at all. So as we face an external threat when it comes to the doctrines of demons and and, and falsehoods and slander and lies, we need to look inward at the one who has redeemed us, the one who dwells within us, the one who has given us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. Ground yourselves in God's love. Not, not, don't be prideful. It's, uh, what I'm saying is that just because we're surrounded by false teachers and people who have fallen away, that isn't to, an opportunity to condescend or belittle, but rather to have compassion. And that brings us to verse 22. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by flesh. That brings us to our last point, reach out to the lost. Reach out to them. So after looking in, inward, 
building ourselves up in Christ. And, and that's common language throughout the New Testament, you know, that we're all together being built up into this temple collectively for the Holy Spirit. But after looking inward, we look at, with mercy and compassion, we look at those around us, the lost. False teachers instill others with doubts, and we have the opportunity to have mercy on those who are drawn into these falsehoods. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness. Do it with respect, not sarcasm and vengeance and, and, and whatever. Any rebuke must be done in love. Any correction or rebuke must be done with the heart for that person reconciling unto God, not out of a desire to be right in an argument, I don't know what it is. We're so obsessed with being right. Well, I know what it is. It's our pride. But there needs to be that desire to honor Christ, not just a desire to win an argument. The way of our Lord Jesus is that of non-retaliation, turning the other cheek, loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute us, not vengeance. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. So people constantly... In argument, grumbling, lovers of self. You know, who does that sound like to you? Don't answer that question. My point is that it's, it's oftentimes it's us. As much as we want to point to the world in someone's Facebook post or Twitter post, I mean, you know, God help me that that's been my heart in all its wickedness, complaining, argumentative. So, as believers, we need to differentiate ourselves from these methods that are used, employed by the ways of the world. We need to differentiate ourselves by abiding in the love of Christ and operating with that, that mercy, that compassion, that truth, but truth in love. It says in First Peter 3, 9, Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. We can't argue people into the kingdom of heaven, but God's kindness is intended to lead men to repentance. We cannot accomplish the righteousness of God with our carnal wrath and, and, and arguing. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, to the obedience of Christ. So we have mercy on those who doubt. We have compassion on them. It says in verse 23, it says, save others by snatching them out of the fire. This word snatching is harpazo. It's the, it's the word that we use for the doctrine of the rapture. In, in, in Latin, it's, it's rapturos. So that snatching refers to this quick and, and, and kind of aggressive movement. And me and Chloe were talking about this passage the other night and kind of just studying it a little bit together. And she was talking about how it just gives, gives the idea of those who, you know, you got the idea of those who doubt. They're kind of getting pulled into some of these philosophies, 
And then she was discussing how this, this, this mental picture that came to her while reading this, that the, the idea that some are sort of playing with hellfire, that they're, as many do, kind of seeing how, how close can they get to the fire without getting burned, which never, never works out in, their, in your favor if you do that. I mean, Christians do it all the time. What can I get away with this? Like, what can I get away with? You know, how far can I push the envelope? We have the opportunity to, by God's grace, if, if able, to pull them out of that, that scenario or, or that way of thinking. Then it says, to others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Hating sin and not the sinner. So the mercy and the compassion that we have for people is balanced with the fact that we still take a stand on sin. Showing mercy and compassion doesn't mean accepting or rather condoning the sin that it snares, ensnares people. Hating sin, mind you, isn't done with a superiority complex, thinking that we're above that, kind of like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable, looks at the tax collector and says, well, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like that guy, a tax collector, a sinner. So the fear is a sobering understanding of how dangerous sin is to the Christian and the non-Christian alike. It says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So the sinfulness of someone else isn't intended us to make, isn't, isn't, we shouldn't, let me slow down with my words for a minute. It's not an opportunity to feel morally superior. Sin poses a threat and a danger to all of us. And the enemy is constantly on the prowl, looking for ways to tempt us and to pull us into the same thing. And it's easy to point at any one sin that we don't struggle with and ignore the ones that we do. They're usually the, the, the really sneaky ones. Pride. Which blinds us to all the other ones. Like lust. Lying. Slander. Grumbling. Hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Not messing with sin, thinking that we're immune to temptation. But there is hope. And, and when we find that in verses 24 and 25, let's read that together. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. We don't have to fear false teachers or the corruption of this world. We should be aware we should be aware of the dangers. We don't want to give undue attention to them, constantly commenting on their Facebook posts or I don't know, whatever. I just... But rather, we trust in God. We know that the Lord is able. We rest in Him and in His finished work. He is able to keep us 
As we keep ourselves in the love of God, he keeps us as well. He's able to sustain us, protect us, and we rest in his finished work. And as you kind of look at the world, not with apathy, not with pride, but with compassion and mercy, we remember where our hope is. And our hope is not in necessarily a political or cultural turnaround. Because we know in the last days, these things are only going to continue to get worse. And so we minister to the lost. We abide in Christ. We mature in him. We grow in his grace in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Firstly, looking inward of who we are in Christ and then looking outward at the mission field, putting hand to plow, doing what Christ has called us to do. Now is not a time to sit on the bench and wait for others to to do what, what the Lord is calling you to do. And so my prayer this morning is that we would be deepening our relationship with the Lord in the midst of, of, of external threats. That we wouldn't allow the enemy to use that to discourage us or to take our eyes off of Christ. As Peter goes out and walks on the water, and then he starts looking at the storms and the wind and the waves, and he freaks out. Knowing that Jesus sustains us, is able to keep us, is, is coming to deliver us. And not just us, but all of creation. Don't be discouraged in the midst of false teachers and doctrines and, and lies and falsehoods, but press deeper and deeper into what you know to be truth. Familiarize yourself with God's word. Know what you believe. Build, not on, 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 on shifting sand, but on a firm foundation. Mature in Christ. Don't rest on the spirituality of your pastor or your spouse or your mom or your dad. But lean on Jesus. Rest on his finished work and build from that place. Hope in the Lord. I wanted to share one more verse with you. It's in Isaiah 49, verse 23. This is the Legacy Standard Bible. It says, And you will know that I am Yahweh, those who hope in me will not be put to shame. You hope in anything else, it will inevitably dis be disappointed. You hope in God, you will not be disappointed. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are and what you've done. Thank you, Lord, that we can rest in your finished work. We ask that you would give us strength and grace and encouragement in the midst of discouraging circumstances. Help us to center ourselves, our hearts, our minds on you and who you are, knowing that you're greater than anything it is that we're going through. May the enemy have no foothold on what you're doing in our lives. May your spirit empower us to build on the firm foundation that you've provided. We thank you, Lord God, that you are trustworthy, you are faithful. If there's anyone here this morning that hasn't trusted in you, 
Lord, soften their hearts on our hearts to the truth that you have revealed to us. Open our eyes to the reality of what you have done on our behalf. You have died for our sins. You have paid the price. Whereas judgment does lie in wait for those who have rejected you. But for us, you haven't destined us for wrath because who, of who we are in you and what your Son has done for us. So we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We pray all this in Jesus' name.